And so we continue with our series tonight, Grace to Flourish Forever. That's my topic. So we're discussing flourishing forever, or you can call it flourishing forever by grace. Um, whichever um, area you want to um, look at it from, grace to flourish forever, flourishing forever by grace. Um, I will be reading a lot of scriptures tonight, so you need to um, bear with me um, as we um, study the word of God tonight. All right, so let's start from our uh, main text for this series. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 1 to 20 is a long reading. I will be skipping them, so you can, console, you can help me to put it on the screen, and let's start from verse 1, the New Living Translation. It says, let me remind you, dear brothers and sisters, of the good news, the good news I preached to you before. You welcome it then and you still stand firm in it. Verse 2 says, it is this good news that saves you if you continue to believe the message I told you. Unless, of course, you believe something that was never true in the first place. Verse 3, which is very, very important. It said, I passed on to you what was most important and what has also been passed on to me. What is most important, when the, 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 uh, uh, the apostle, Apostle Paul was writing to them, he mentioned to them that what he's sharing with them is very, very important. He said Christ died for our sins, just as scripture said, he was buried and he was raised from the dead on the third day, just as the scripture said. You know, let me move to verse 10. Please go to verse 10. You know, talking about um, people, many people saw him, verse 10. Please, can we read verse 10 together, everyone? Let's read. But whatever I am now, it is all because God poured out a special favor on me and not without results. For I have worked harder than any of the other apostles, yet it was not I, but God was working through me by his grace. Your life will not lack results. Amen. Oh, your human can be stronger than this. Amen. Yeah, it says, but, I, but tell me this, since we preach verse 12, Verse 12, I'm reading verse 12 now. But tell me this since we preach that Christ rose from the dead. Why are some of you saying there is no resurrection of the dead? For if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, then all our preaching is useless. And your faith is useless. And we apostles will, will all be lying about God. For we have said that God raised Christ from the grave. But that, but that can't be true if there is no resurrection of the dead. Verse 16. If there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not been raised. And if, and if Christ has not been raised, then your faith is useless. And you are still guilty of your sins. Verse 18. In that case, all who have died believing in Christ are lost. Verse 19. All of us, let's read together. Verse 19. Can we read together? And if our hope in Christ is only for this life, we are more to be pitied than anyone in the world. Verse 20. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead is the first of a great harvest of all who have died. Now put the message translation there because the message um, has a very, very interesting message. From verse 10, message, I will, I will read verse 10 and then I will read 19 to 20, message, um, the same scripture. It's about because God was so gracious, so very generous, here I am, and I'm not about to let his grace to go to waste. Haven't I worked at trying to do more than any of the others? Even then, my work didn't amount to all that much. It was God giving me the work to do, God giving me the energy to do it. Verse 19, everyone, verse 19. If all we get out of Christ is a little inspiration for a few short years, we're a pretty sorry lot. But the truth is that Christ has been raised up the first in a long legacy of those who are going to leave the symmetry. Hallelujah. Death is not the termination of our life. Death is a transition to a better glory. So we are living the symmetry. Yes, because Jesus conquered death for us. So we have established in this series that God wants us to flourish here on earth and also to flourish in eternity because there is more to our lives than what we see in this physical world. 
So we have established that God wants us to flourish here and also to flourish in eternity. And I want us to know tonight as an individual, our identity is not limited to what we see. We are not just physical beings, we are spiritual beings. We have body, we have a soul, and we have a spirit, and that's why we are known as human beings. We are being, so we live forever. We live forever. So when Jesus was going, he told his disciples, you know, when they were asking, when is he going to restore the kingdom to Israel, you know, he responded to them and he told them that they should receive power. And after, you know, you know, he was elevated, ascended to heaven. The angels told them that the same way he went is going to come. That you find that in Acts chapter 1, verse 6 to 11. So Jesus is coming back again. Tell someone Jesus is coming back again. Oh, say like you mean, say Jesus is coming back again. He's coming back again. My God is coming back. How many of us? He went away and he's promised that he's coming back again. Oh, yes, he's coming back again. My God is coming back again. Ah, oh, glory, hallelujah. He's coming back again. Let's sing it again. He's coming back again. My God is coming back again. Oh, yes, he went away. And he promised that he's coming back again. Oh, yes, he's coming back again. My Lord is coming back again. Oh, glory, hallelujah, he's coming back again. You see, when you have a good understanding that Christ is coming back again, it gives you a very, very good perspective, an outstanding perspective about life, how to conduct your life and how to live your life. Because Christ is coming back again. It's coming back again. It's coming back again. It will help you to prepare for life beyond now. It will help you to conduct your life aright. And so it was so interesting to me that, that Paul introduced the dimension of grace talking about the resurrection. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 10. And I was wondering why did he introduce the dimension of grace when he was talking about resurrection? It was simply because there are things that you can't do on your own if you want to experience the coming back of Christ. You need the grace of God. So it is your understanding of the grace of God that will give you outstanding transformation of life and outstanding preparation for resurrection. It is your understanding of the grace of God. It said, I do not take the grace of God for granted. And because of that, I do. I work more than the rest of the apostles. You need to understand. Because it is God's grace that saved you in this first place. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 6 to 10 says, By grace you have been saved, not of your works, lest no man should boast. Titus chapter 2, verse 11. It said, The grace that brings salvation has appeared unto all men, teaching us to deny ungodliness and to lay hold on the truth. So you are saved by grace and you stand on this salvation by the grace of God. Romans chapter 5, it said, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God. Verse 2 says, in this grace we stand. You are standing by the grace of God and you are strengthened to true life afflictions and challenges by the grace of God. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9, when Paul was going through all the difficult situations, preaching the gospel, they stoned him, they beat him. It was almost as if everything was, was rough with him. God appeared to him and said, my grace is sufficient for you. He said, for my strength is made perfect in your weakness. For someone here tonight, God's grace is sufficient for you. You will not give up. I say you will not give up on your faith. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ. The summary of the gospel is simply the grace of God. Paul was telling the Galatian Christians in Galatians chapter 1 verse 6. He said, I am so surprised that you have soon turned away from the gospel. And he summarized, he said, the gospel of grace. And he said over and over again, he said, if any man comes to you to preach another gospel than what we preach to you, he said, let him be accursed. He said, even if an angel appeared to you and preach another gospel, let him be accursed. 
You can't walk with Christ without understanding the grace of God. As a matter of fact, you, you cannot continue to serve God in difficult situations without the grace of God. I pray for someone here tonight, receive fresh grace to serve God afresh. Oh, your amen can be louder than this. If I pray for you now that you receive 10 billion naira in your account, your amen will tear the roof. I say receive fresh grace to serve God afresh. <laughs> and so I'm going to be looking at two factors, you know, that will help us to prepare for eternity or that will help us to flourish forever. Number one, I, 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 I say it's the possibility, the positivity and the provisions of life beyond now. The possibility and the positivity and the provisions of life beyond now. By that, I mean that, that, that there is what we call, you know, uh, 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 the, 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 the dimensions of life. We have what is known as the bipolar dimension of life and the unipolar dimension of life. By that, I mean in this part of the world, you have what is known as good and evil. You have what is known as light and darkness. You have what is known as hatred and, and what and love. You have what is known as wealth and what again and, and poverty. But in the life that we are talking about that God wants to flourish beyond beyond now and there is a life that is known as a unipolar world. In, in that place there is only good and good. There is only light and light. There is no darkness there. There is only wealth and wealth. There is no poverty there. I'm going to show you in scriptures now. There is no sickness there. There is no sorrow there. There is no, <laughs> there is no, there is no pain there. In fact, there is no injustice there because you have a perfect government there. They don't snatch election boxes there. <laughs> there is no glitch there. <laughs> there is no switching of IREP there. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it is, it's a place that we all should yearn to be. In that place, they don't hide palliatives. Because everything is in abundance. In that place, they don't hide palliatives. In that place, the road is paved with gold. Hallelujah, that's the place you are going. That's the place you are going. In that place, somebody is not saying, pack, 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 disturbing you. The security system is very, very high there. Very, very powerful. Oh, thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. That's where you are going. That's where you are going. I said, that's where you are going. Yeah. Heaven is guaranteed for you. Yeah. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ. In that place, there is perfect judgment there. I love one of the scriptures that senior pastor used on Sunday in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 5. It says, so in the message translation, it says, don't get ahead of the master and jump to conclusion with your judgment before all the evidence is, is in. When he comes, it will bring out the, the hope on and place, and place in evidence all kinds of things we've never uh, even dreamed of, inner motives and purposes and prayers. Only then will, 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 will any one of us get to hear, well done. There is perfect judgment there. There is no one to be bribed there because God is the judge of all. God is the judge of all. That's where we are going. So we have the provision of a better life. I love, I love this so much. I love this so much. In Revelation chapter, chapter, chapter 21, Revelation chapter 21, I will just speak for verse 3. It said, And I heard a thunderous voice from the throne, the saying, Look, God's tabernacle is with human beings, and from now on, he will tabernacle with them as their God. Now God himself, I'm reading the Passion Translation, and God will have his own with them. God's with them will be their God. He will wipe away every tear. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes and eliminate death entirely. No one will mourn or weep any longer. The pain of wounds will no longer exist. The old order has ceased. The city, verse 18, put verse 18 there, it said the city was pure gold, clear, and crystal, and it was, and its wall was made of jasper. Verse 23, it said the city has no need for the sun or moon to shine, for the glory of God is its light, and its lamb is the lamb. So you can imagine where we are going. Where we are going, the light here is more than band A lights. And there is no increase of tariff there. Oh, tell somebody, you have a better place, man. <laughs> Hallelujah. 
Hallelujah. This is where we are going. So when we have anticipation and we have expectation of the blessings that God has preserved us for, for eternity, we will yearn. We will yearn more and we will prepare to meet with God. We will prepare to meet with God. And, and so, so this is where we are actually going. You know, you know while I was, I was preparing, in my mind I was just laughing by myself. As I look at, look at where we are going, they are not discussing increase of wages there, whether it's minimum wage, it's living wage, or whatever, and some people are debating about it. Because here, there is plenty here. There is plenty here. You see, God created everything in abundance. It is the greed, the greed of man that is making people to suffer. That was why God created everything, created everything before he kept man here. But when man came here with greed, look at what is happening. I was in the mall some days ago, you know, and I was wondering, you know, a woman woke up to me. Did she walk up to me? Or I had, a, I, wa I wanted to pay the cashier, you know, and I had this elderly woman. It, it, it pierced my heart. I had her talking to one of the attendants and she was pricing bread in the mall. She was pricing bread in the mall. It struck my heart. How will an elderly woman, that was almost around 7.30 there about, and she was pricing bread. So when I had her, I woke up to her and I bought the bread for her, gave her extra money, and I asked her, this bread around 7.30, Mama, what are you going to use to eat this bread? She, said, she spoke in Yoruba language. Oh, mommy, ah. Tima koja seo in law, why be something And I'm and I'm wondering, you know what that means? She's going to get where they are going to where they sell beans at 7:30 in the night. Elderly woman, 7:30 in the night. So God is rescuing us from a system that is perverse and, and putting us into a system where we will have abundance. I pray in the name of Jesus, you will not miss heaven. Amen. Oh, I say you, you will not miss heaven. Your family members will not miss heaven. Amen. Even your enemies will not miss heaven. <laughs> In the mighty name of Jesus Christ. So we are, we are reminding you that there is, there is a better place beyond what we are. Ex if, you, if you've ex ever experienced wealth, have you ever seen anywhere in the, in the whole world where the street is paved with gold? All the street is paved with gold. You can't see. But that's where we are going. I say you will not miss your portion. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ. So this is the provision that we have. So the next one is very, very important because this is the, uh, where I'm going to take all my time and explain what we need to do to experience what God has prepared for us. Preparation and readiness for life beyond now. That's the second thing I want us to talk about tonight as we rise up to pray. Preparation and readiness for the life beyond now. There are several scriptures that I want us to read under this preparation. Number one, Matthew chapter 24, verse 44. Matthew 24, verse 44, the AMPC said, You also must be ready, therefore, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour where you do not expect him. Tell somebody, be ready. Be ready. Oh, you are not saying like you mean, say be ready. be ready. Matthew 25, verse 10. While they were going away to buy, the bridegroom came, and those who were prepared went in with him to, to the marriage feast, and the door was shut. Those who were prepared. Revelation chapter 19, verse 7. It said, Let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his wife has made herself what? Can we say it together? Has made herself what? Ready. Amos chapter 4, verse 12. The New King James Version. It said, therefore, thus will I do to you, O Israel, because I will do this to you. What did he say? Prepare to meet your God, O Israel. Tell somebody, prepare. prepare. Ask the person beside you, how prepared are you? <laughs> how prepared are you? How prepared are you? If you know that this is what God has provided for us, how are you prepared to enjoy what God has pro provided for you? How prepared are you? And Jesus is saying that those that were ready and prepared, they were able to go with him. So the reason why we are teaching this is so that we can live prepared. What did the Boy Scout motto? What does he say? What does he say? Be prepared. So God wants us to prepare. Because Jesus is coming at a time <laughs> where you don't know. He said the bridegroom is coming at a time where you don't expect him to come. 
That's why you need to prepare. That's why you need to prepare. I love um, 2 Timothy chapter 4. 2 Timothy chapter 4, I will read from 7 to 8 and 11. Today is Bible study. I told you earlier when we started that you are going to read plenty of Bible. Yeah, so let's read together. 2 Timothy chapter 4, New Living Translation. Let's go. Do not waste time arguing over godless ideas and old wife tales. Instead, what did he say? Train yourself to be godly. Physical training is good, but training for godliness is much better. Promising benefits in this life and in the life to come. Verse 11. Teach these things and insist that everyone lend them. You can see that word, insist. That everyone lend them because there is a better life beyond this life. So he's telling us that we should train ourselves, you know, into godliness. So when you have a solid conviction and expectation of a life that is beyond now, it will give you, you know, capacity for solid preparation. Please write that down. When you have a solid conviction and expectation for a life that is beyond now, it will give you the motivation and capacity, you know, for solid preparation. For solid preparation for eternity. So you need to be prepared. So he's telling us that we should be prepared. We should live ready. We should live ready. We should be ready for eternity because that is the reality of every man. That is the reality of our life. We should live for eternity. You know, when we started this series, we spoke about, you know, the life of um, um, this man known as Methuselah. Methuselah lived how many years? 969 years. So no matter how long you live, compared to eternity, it's, it's minor. In fact, there is a scripture in 2 Peter. It said a day before God is what? Like 1,000 years. And 1,000 years before God is like a day. So in eternity, if you live one, <laughs> no matter how you live here, it can't compare to eternity. It can't compare to eternity. So you need to prepare. It, it, it's quite amazing for me how a lot of people prepare for exams, prepare for, uh, for, 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 for job interview, prepare for visa interview, prepare for a whole lot of things, but they don't prepare for eternity. They don't prepare for eternity. All those things are ephemeral. How are you preparing for eternity? Just look at what the prophet said in Amos chapter 4, verse 12. He said, oh Israel, prepare to meet with your God. How prepared are you? You know, because the truth is that, <laughs> will you be ready when the Lord shall come? <laughs> you, know, you know, will you be ready when your time is come? Or when your time is up? Will you be ready? Because when you are preparing, there is no time. There is no timetable for eternity. There is no timetable for eternity. You need to live ready. And I'm going to be sharing with us some of the things that will help you to live ready for eternity because that preparation is very, very important for us. It's that it's coming like a thief in the night. It's coming when no one expects. You know, Jesus spoke about, you know, he said this day that the Son of Man will return, it will be like the days of Noah. He said they will be eating and drinking, getting married, doing all manner of things, and then the Lord will come. You will not be caught on our ways. Yeah. Oh, your amen can be stronger than this. Yeah. I say you will not be caught on our ways. Yeah. In the name of Jesus, you will be ready. Yeah. Every day you will be ready. Yeah. Nothing will distract you in the name of Jesus. So number one, how do you live ready? Focus on the purpose of God for creating you. How do you live ready? Focus on the purpose of God for creating you. God created you. The senior pastor said on Sunday that there is a goal that you didn't choose for yourself, the goal to be born on this earth. That's one. You didn't set that for yourself. God set that for yourself. In other words, there is a purpose of God for your life. And you need to understand that very purpose and live and live in that very purpose. I love this. Put that scripture there for me. Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 11 to 12. Ecclesiastes chapter 3, the Amplified Classic Rendition. Please, let's read together. Please, can we read like a mass choir, please? Everyone, let's go. He has also planted eternity in men's hearts and minds, a divinely implanted sense of a purpose, walking through the ages, which nothing under the sun but God alone can satisfy. Yet, so that men cannot find out what God has done from the beginning to the end, there is, an, there is a divine purpose for your life. 
And that was why God told Jeremiah chapter 1, Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 5. He said, before you were formed, before your father and your mother planned to meet together, he said, I have called you and set you apart so that you become a prophet to the nations. I have a special purpose for you. And then you need to understand that purpose. I'm going to be reading um, 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 three or four scriptures here for you to understand the importance of purpose. Je um, Acts chapter 13, verse 36. Put that scripture there for me. Let's read together. Acts chapter 13, verse 36, AMPC. For David, after he has served God's will and purpose and counsel in his own generation, fell asleep in death and was buried among his forefathers. And he did, and he did see corruption and undergo purification and dissolution of the grave. So David served God's will and purpose in his own generation. Let's read about Jesus. John chapter 12, verse 27. Passion translation. John chapter 12, verse 27. He said, even though I am torn within and my soul is in turmoil, I will not ask the Father to rescue me from this hour of trial. For I have come to fulfill. Tell somebody, fulfill your purpose. Oh, preach to another person. Say, fulfill your purpose. He said, I have come to fulfill my purpose to offer myself to God. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 10, Paul was encouraging his protege, Timothy. He said, now, AMPC, now you have closely observed and diligently followed my teachings, conduct, purpose in life, faith, patience, love, and steadfastness. Please, I want you to know something. That the fulfillment of your purpose is superior to the achievement of your plans. Please write that down. The fulfillment of your God-ordained purpose is superior to the achievement of your personal plans on earth. Because that is what God will be measuring your life on when you see him in eternity. The fulfillment of your God-ordained purpose is superior to the achievement of your own personal plans on the earth. You know, while I was preparing, the story of Moses just came into my mind. Moses, you know, God has a special purpose for Moses, and then God placed him in a place where he was going to fulfill his purpose. Moses grew up in the palace, and he was being trained to become the second pharaoh. And then he dawned on him that I am not meant to sit here. I pray for someone here today. Everywhere you are, that is not the place of your purpose. God will relocate you from that place. So you can imagine if Moses had sat down in Egypt, the, 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 the greatest civilization in those days, and he was enjoying the chariots. They were moving him around, having pot belly, eating chicken, and eating turkey, crossing his leg, and be enjoying life, and be saying, oh, I am enjoying, I am enjoying. God has blessed me. And then in heaven, in the archive of heaven, angels will be laughing, angels will be crying. When will you deliver? When will this deliverer get up from here and deliver the multitudes of people that God has sent him? You know, I pray in the name of Jesus you will not lose your assignment. Amen. You will not lose your purpose. You will not lose your purpose. I say you will not lose your purpose. Amen. Money will not distract you from fulfilling your purpose. Amen. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ. If Moses didn't rise up to fulfill his purpose, today we will not see the record of the first five books of the Bible being written you know, on the record of his name. In fact, he will not discover that. It was in the process of delivering the children of Israel that he got the revelation of creation. A lot of people don't know, they don't know the implication of, of, of living for survivor without significance. A lot of people don't know the implication. You are robbing a whole generation. Look at what the Bible says concerning David. It said David served the will of God for his generation. There is something inside you that is greater than money. It is called meaning. There is money, there is, there is meaning inside you that is greater than money. A generation is waiting for you to arise. I pray for someone here today, receive grace to fulfill your purpose. Receive grace to fulfill your purpose. This is what will make you to prepare for eternity. Because when you face God, God will not ask you how many houses did you build. God will not ask you the, the children that you give back to. God will not ask you uh, some of those things that you, are, that you are running up and that God will ask you, why I created you? Did you discover? Did you fulfill it? Did you discover? Did you fulfill it? Because God is going to ask you that. God is going to judge you that. You know, Sinobas was talking on Sunday. He said, you know, for believers, God is going to judge us. He's going to ask us the gift and the potential. Thank God for Romans chapter 11, verse 29. He said, the gift and the calling of God are without repentance. In other words, they are irrevocable. When you 
when, you know, you know it's, it's quite amazing to me that when Jesus was talking about eternity, talking about the end, that was when he talked about the parable of the, of, of, of the talents. Because God is going to ask you, what did you do with what he gave to you? I pray you will not miss it in the name of Jesus Christ. For someone here today, you are afraid. Receive grace to fulfill your purpose. I say receive grace to fulfill your purpose. See, God didn't create you to just exist and exit this planet. God didn't create you to just exist and exit this planet. God created you to have, you know, an excellent impact on the planet. So you need to understand your purpose and fulfill your purpose because God is going to ask you that in eternity. Number two, you need to focus on the principles of the word of God. You need to focus on the principles of the word of God because the word of God is eternal, is going to prepare you for the life that is eternal. The word of God is eternal. You can write Psalm 119, verse 89. It said, forever, O God, your word is settled in heaven. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 8. It said, the grass wither, the flower fades, but the word of God abides forever. Matthew chapter 24, verse 35. Mark chapter 13, verse 31. Luke chapter 21, verse 33. It said, heaven and earth shall fail, but the word of the Lord will not fail. Nothing prepares us for eternity like the word of God. Nothing prepares us for eternity like the word of God. So I, I, I always wonder how a lot of Christians trivialize the word of God. The word of God is eternal. It said the grass with Isaiah 48 and the flower fades, but the word of God abides forever. The word of God, the word of God, you know, the inspiration of the word of God came from eternity. So that is what is going to equip you and empower you, to, you know, for eternity. You need to study the word of God. You need to know the word of God for yourself. Don't be like the Pharisees and the Sadducees who are just living by ESA of, 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 their, of their teachers. They didn't read the Bible. Jesus always have issues with them. In Matthew chapter 12, verse 5, Jesus said, have you never read? Matthew chapter 19, verse 4, have you never read? Matthew chapter 16, 21, verse 16, have you never read? Matthew chapter 21, verse 46, have you never read? Matthew chapter 24, verse 15, have you never read? Because they were not reading. They were not reading the scriptures. They were just walking by hearsay and philosophies of men. In fact, they came to ask Jesus in heaven when they said a, 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 a man married one wife, married and then he died, and then the brothers married, married, married her, and then seven of them married her. So when they get to heaven, who is going to be who is going to be the husband? Jesus said, "You guys are very foolish." Look at the way Jesus responded to them. <laughs> Mark chapter. Oh, I love this. Mark chapter. Mark chapter 12, verse 24 to 25. Please put that scripture there for me. Mark chapter 12, verse 24 to 25. Jesus said, you are way off base. And here is why. One, you don't know your Bibles. Two, you don't know how God works. 25, after the dead are raised up, we are past the marriage business. As it is with angels now, all our ecstasies and intimacies then will be with God. You can imagine, they were not studying. In fact, because there is a place that says that God calls himself the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Jesus said they were not reading. The reason why a lot of Christians are being deceived today, you know, they take whatever they hear from everywhere, hook, line, and sinker, and fisherman, and boot, and swallow, because they don't study the Bible. They don't know. He said, my people are destroyed, Hosea chapter 4, verse 6, because they lack knowledge. And what is the knowledge that God is talking about? 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. It says, study. Says, tell somebody, say, study. study. If you don't want to become stupid, study. It says, study to so show yourself approved as a workman that, 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 that is not ashamed. Rightly dividing the word of truth. Study. Paul was telling Timothy, he said, till I come, 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 13, give attention to reading. Give attention to reading and to the doctrine. Give attention to reading. Don't go on vacation. And that's why he told the Ephesians elders in Acts chapter 20, verse 32. He said, I commend you to God and the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and grant you your inheritance among them that are sanctified. Before the, the word will bless you, the word will first of all build you. So you need to take time to study. You know, I, I, I so much wonder how a lot of people carry, you know, magazines and books, you know, you know, your journals, you know, big books, and then they sit down and finish them. And then when they carry the Bible, they will just carry the Bible like this, you know, and just sit down in Ephesians chapter 1 for two weeks. Ephesians chapter 1, just six books for two weeks. 
and then they'll be, they'll be watching on video. They can sit and watch season one to season 20. Just read Galatians like that. They're just sitting there like that there. When it's time for movies, their eyes will be wide like this. When it's time for the Bible, one angel, angel fatai will just blow breeze upon them. <laughs> and then they will be sleeping. They will be sleeping. Because they don't know. They don't know that when you allow the devil to rob you from reading the scriptures, you see, the script is, 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 the scripture is the script that shows us our future. The scripture is the script that shows us our future, our future inheritance in heaven. So we should not allow the devil to rob us. The Bible, write it down in an acronym. The Bible is blessed inspiration, bringing life eternal. Write it down as an acronym. That's what the Bible means. Blessed inspiration, bringing life eternal. So if you want to enjoy eternal life, you must sit down with the word. Tell somebody, sit down with the word. <laughs> oh, you're not saying like you say, sit down with the word of God. So if you want to prepare, now let's read 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. I love this so much. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 to 17, the Amplified Classic rendition. It said, every scripture, somebody say every scripture. Is God breathed, given by inspiration, and profitable for instruction, for reproof, for conviction of sin, for correction of errors, and discipline in obedience, and for training in righteousness, in holy living, in conformity to God's way, in conduct, purpose, and action. It says, so that, let's read 17 together, everyone, let's read like a mass choir. So that the man of God may be what? Complete and what? Proficient and what? Well fitted and what? Thoroughly equipped for every good work. See what the Bible will do for you. You will be proficient so that your life will not be deficient. You will be proficient for every good work. The word of God will prepare you. The word of God will make you fit. The same way you get a coach that makes you fit for a, for a football match or, a, or whatever match is it. That's what the word of God will do for you. That's what the word of God will do for you. So you need to give time to the world. Tell somebody give time to the world. That's what will prepare you for eternity. Number three. Number three. I can spend a whole day talking about that. Number three. Preaching of the gospel to make disciples. Preaching of the gospel to make disciples. Preaching of the gospel to make disciples. This is what will prepare you for eternity. Jesus was talking in, in Matthew chapter 24 verse 14. He said the gospel of the kingdom will be preached and then the end will come. Matthew chapter 28, verse 18 to 20, it said, go into the world and make disciples of all nations. Romans 1, 16, it said, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It's the power of God unto salvation to those who believe. So when you're preaching the gospel, in fact, I love what I saw in, in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 24 to 27, the Passion Translation. Listen to this. It said, isn't it obvious that all runners on the racetrack keep on running to win, but only one received the victorious prize? I'm reading the Passion Translation. Yet each one of you must run the race to be victorious. Verse 25, a true athlete will be disciplined in every respect, practicing constant self-control in order to win a laurel rut that quick, quickly with us. But we run a race to win a victor's crown that will last forever. That's what we are talking about. Oh, thank you, Lord Jesus. What you are receiving from Christ will last forever. Verse 26, it says, for that reason, I don't run just for exercise or box like one throwing aimless punches. Verse 27, please let's read together. Verse 27, but I train like a champion athlete. I subdue my body and get it under my control so that after preaching the good news to others, I myself won't be disqualified. In other words, when you are making disciples, it helps you to be disciplined. Please write that down. When you are preaching to make disciples, it helps you to be disciplined for eternity. Because you will want to be a model. You don't want to be a model, you know, uh, preaching what you are not practicing. So, a lot of people don't know what they are missing when they are not preaching the gospel. When they are not making disciples, you are missing a lot. You are missing a lot. You will, it will compel you to conform your attitude and, to, and your character to what you are preaching. You can imagine yourself trying to win some, trying to win a soul, you know, on your street, and then, you know, you know you've, the person has given his life to Christ, and then uh, something happened one day, and then somebody provoke you, and then you want to burst into anger, and you see the soul of the person that you just preached. What will happen to you? My friend, you will do what you will behave. 
you will behave. Because the person will look at you like this. You will behave. And that's what, you know, that's what preaching of the gospel does. It helps you to prepare for eternity. It helps you to live your life well. It helps you to flourish forever. As a matter of fact, please, please put Daniel chapter 12 verse 3 for me. I love this. Let's read, let's read together. Daniel 12 verse 3, the New Living Translation. Everyone, let's go. Those who are wise will shine as bright as the sky. And those who lead many to righteousness will do what? Will shine like stars forever. When you are leading people to God, you will be shining. You will be shining. Number four. Let me quickly run through this. Number four, and then we pray. What is number one? Please look into your note. Number one, what's number one? Focus on the purpose of God for your life. Number two. Focus on the principles of the word of God. Number three. Preaching of the gospel to make disciples. Number four. Preserving lives with your potentials with your prosperity, with your projects and resources. Preserving lives with your potentials, with your prosperity, with your projects and resources. Because on the last day, Jesus said, go and read Matthew's a long reading, Matthew 25, verse 31 to 46. Jesus said on the last day, I will separate the sheep from the goats. He said, and then they will ask. He said, I will say to those, you know, I love this. I don't know if I should just, if I should just take it. Verse 35 says, For I was hungry, and you fed me. I was thirsty, and you gave me a drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me into your house. I was naked, and you gave me clothing. I was sick, and you cared for me. I was in prison, and you visited me. Then these righteous ones will reply, Lord, when did we ever see you hungry and, and feed you or test you and give you something to drink or stranger and show you hospitality or naked and give you clothing? Then, then they will hear, then when, then when did we ever see you sick or in prison and visit you? Verse 40, and the king will say, I tell you the truth. When you did this to one of the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you were doing it to me. You were doing it to me. Jesus was talking about the impact of what will happen in eternity. So God is saying, if you want to prepare for eternity, you need to live open-handed. Because you brought nothing into this world and you are taking nothing away. No matter how aka glue your hand is, or aka gum, as they call it, you know, you, you, no matter how selfish you are, the day you die like this is finished. That's the end. That's the end. You had the story of someone that was very stingy, you know, that was not blessing people, and the day they were burying him, I think one of the family wrote a check and dropped it in the coffin. I said, you go and catch it, <laughs> cash the check. You know, you, when, when you die, God is going to ask you, what did you do with your resources? And that's why God was, you know, was talking about the rich fool in Luke chapter 12. If you read verse, from verse 13 to 21, he was just talking about I, I, I will build my, I will put down my barn, I will say to my soul, I will do this, I, 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 if you count it, almost six times. He didn't mention the name of his neighbor, he didn't mention the name of his brother, he didn't mention anybody, he was just I. You know, people will just get all they can, put it in the can, sit on the can, and cover the can. God doesn't want us to live like that. You know, Paul said in, in, in Acts chapter 20, verse 35, he said, remember the words of the Lord Jesus that he said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. It's more blessed to give than to receive. This is what we'll, we'll prepare because the Bible says in, 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 oh, I love this, in Matthew, in Matthew, in Matthew chapter, it said where your treasure is, Matthew chapter 6, that is where your heart will be. If your treasure is in heaven, you will use that treasure to, to touch lives and transform lives on earth. There are several presidents today that people have forgotten about them. But there is a name that you always remember, even if you don't know much about her. Who have, who have ever heard about Mother Teresa here? Yeah, that's a life of impact. I pray in the name of Jesus Christ. When you, will, you will not just fizzle out of the world in the name of Jesus. People will remember your good works. Your good works will impact generations. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ. So what are you doing with your gifts? What are you doing with your resources? What are you doing with your money? If you want to live forever, you must focus on transforming lives with what God has given to you. And number five, tonight, as I take the last one and we pray. Number five. Number five. Purity of heart and acts. Purity of acts and acts. Purity of your heart and your acts. Your acts talks about your action. 
Please, I'd like you to put Galatians chapter 5, verse 19 to 21, the Passion Translation for me. I'd like us to read together. The Bible, you know, you know, preaches itself there. Let's read. Galatians chapter 5, verse 19 to 21. Let's read together. Everyone, let's go. The behavior of the self-life is obvious. Sexual immorality, lustful thoughts, pornography, chasing after things instead of God, manipulating others, hatred of those who get in your way, senseless arguments, resentment when others are favored, temper tantrums, angry quarrels, only thinking of yourself, being in love with your own opinions. Verse 21, being envious of the blessings of others, murder, uncontrolled addictions, wide parties, and all other similar behaviors. Haven't I already warned you that those who use their freedom for these things will not inherit the kingdom realm of God? So God wants us to live a pure life. God wants us to have a pure heart. And God wants to live a pure life. Because as a believer, you know, a lot of people don't understand. The liberty that God has given to us is a liberty to do what is right and not what we like. The liberty that God has given to us is a liberty to do what is right and not what we like. You know, people say we are in the days of grace. You can do whatever you like. The same Apostle Paul that talked about grace. It's like, shall we, shall, shall we continue in sin that grace be abound? What did he say? He said, God forbid. As a matter of fact, you don't understand. When you are asking God for grace, you are asking God for empowerment to do what you can do by yourself. And that's why the Bible says in Romans chapter 6, verse 14, it says, sin shall no longer have dominion over you because you are not under the law, you are under grace. Somebody receive grace tonight. Amen. Oh, I say receive grace tonight. Amen. Receive grace over that weakness. Receive grace over that anger. Receive grace over that, that weakness in the name of Jesus Christ. When you have grace, the grace of God will help you to grow above all those weaknesses. The grace of God will help you to grow above those weaknesses. So God wants us to live right. Now, please listen to me. A little sin does not have a little stain. A little sin does not have a little stain. You know, somebody just say, eh, me, I, I'm just, it's just little. That was how Judas started, little by little, stealing from Jesus. Little by little. If you read John chapter 12, the Bible says he was always preferring from the boss. He was stealing like that little by little, little by little, until he sold his master. I pray in the name of Jesus Christ, God save someone from every little sin today. In the name of Jesus. Judas didn't know. Do you know that Judas was an apostle? Judas was one of the people that Jesus sent out. They went out and healed and came back with report. Judas was one of them. How can you imagine that Judas sold Jesus? How can you imagine someone that tasted power, someone that casted out devil, someone that came back and said, demons were subject to us in your name because he was playing with little sin. He was playing with little sin, just stealing, just like that. Some people lying, lying. They will send you an errand. Return the money in your organization. You will say you are smart. That is not smartness. That is foolishness. That is stealing. You know, some people steal and they call themselves being sharp. That's not being sharp. That is stealing. When they send you, return the change. It's not your own. If you take it, it will change you down. <laughs> it will change you now. It is not breakthrough. It is breakdown. It's breakdown. It's not breakthrough. In fact, a lot of, Christ, a lot of people are, are, are tarnishing the name of Christ because they are, not, they, are not, they are not exhibiting the virtues of Christ. And you have the capacity to live above this. I pray in the name of Jesus, enjoy supernatural grace today. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ. And finally tonight, the power of the Holy Spirit. For you to prepare for the kingdom of God, the power of the Holy Spirit. When you read Matthew chapter 25, when Jesus was talking about the ten virgins and the foolish virgin, you know, he said those that were wise had extra oil. Those that were foolish didn't have extra oil. The oil there, you know, is a symbolism, you know, of the power of the Holy Spirit. When you read Zechariah chapter 4, verse 6, please put Zechariah chapter 4, verse 6 there. They amplify classic rendition and then we'll rise up to pray. Zechariah chapter 4, verse 6. Amplify classic rendition. He said, then he said to me, the, uh, this addition of the bowl of the candlestick causing it to yield a ceaseless supply of oil. I love that ceaseless supply of oil from the olive tree. It's the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel saying, not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, of whom the oil is a symbol, says the Lord of all. Somebody say, not by might. <laughs> say, not by power. Say, by my spirit. God is empowering somebody here afresh. 
in the name of Jesus Christ. God is empowering your prayer life afresh. God is empowering your spirit life afresh. God is empowering the study of the word of God afresh in you. God is giving you power to do good works. Do you know that without the power of the Holy Spirit, you can never even do good works? The Bible says, Acts chapter 10 verse 38, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and power who went about doing what? Doing good. Rise upon your feet tonight. Do Doing good. Jesus was anointed. I, re- I pray for someone here tonight. Receive fresh anointing of the Holy Spirit. I'd like you to lift your voice tonight and ask God for fresh power. Daystar, raising role models.